shiver in the cold But I did say you'd never walk through this world alone And I did say Don't make this world your home In every time of heat My love will be the anchor That you can hold on to This is the promise This is the promise I've made to you I never said that friends Would never turn their backs on you Or that the world around you wouldn't see you as a fool, but I did say like me, you'll surely be despised. And I did say, my ways confound the wise. I didn't say you'd never face the bitter kiss of or have to walk through chilly Jordan to enter into rest But I did say I'd be waiting right on the other side Yeah And I did say I'll dry every tear you cry Cause you know I made a promise that I prepared a place And someday sooner than you think You'll see me face to face And you'll sing with the angels And a countless multitude This is the promise This is the promise I've made to you be your light that hell can't separate us we're gonna make it through this is the promise this is the promise I've made to you have your Bibles this morning, I would invite you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, Joshua 1, and we will be looking at verses 10 through 18, Joshua chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. There was a, a movie that came out roughly this time last year entitled uh, Dunkirk, and, and uh, the movie uh, is, is based on the true story in which um, the, the British troops during World War II uh, were stranded on this island, as it were. Uh, they had a battle, uh, a base there. And the Nazis came over the head, invaded France, and so they were flying in to completely desecrate 
uh, the, the British soldiers that were there stationed on this little island called Dunkirk. And, and they were completely uh, isolated. They, they had already gone in and blown up the ships. The, the soldiers were stuck there. There was no way out except for a few brave souls. Citizens hopping on ships, going out to save these soldiers, as many as they could fit on a boat, taking their very lives into their own hands in order to save these men who were fighting for freedom. Now, bear in mind, this is a very decisive point in, in, in world history, especially in, in the Second World War, uh, particularly because of the fact if uh, the Nazis had overtaken Dunkirk, they would have had a, a small island there, uh, their own, and it would have made any sort of, of battles and, and raids on um, the continent of England or, or the, the country of England uh, to, to go right over and, and take over the country of England. It would have been uh, a decisive blow in which the Nazis would have controlled all of free Europe. But a few people came together to prevent this. Winston Churchill, uh, a short time after that, gave uh, an iconic speech. He, he uh, spoke and he said, We shall go to the end. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the seas and the oceans, we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. It was a serious matter. Surrender was not an option. It was a fight to the death, and it was a fight for freedom. We see here today in our passage uh, a similar uh, battle cry, a similar rallying of the troops, if you will. Joshua has just received word from the Lord himself that they will go into this land, and he will deliver it into their hands, but it will be uh, a great fight. The Lord will be with them, though. So Joshua therefore goes into the people and he has them command them to prepare themselves to cross over into enemy territory. The Israelites were faced with a great task and it would require all of them, all of them working together to enter what we see in our text today is the place of God's rest. What I want us to see today, for the Christian, the same is true. We enter God's rest together, together, all of us. This fight that we fight in this world is one which takes all of God's people working together, overcoming the powers that be, breaking forth in a dark world the light of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We fight and we enter God's rest together. We are about to take up and read, but before we do, Let us ask for the Holy Spirit's help in prayer. O great God and Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you be with us this morning. Have our minds focus on you, O Lord. Let us recognize what this is, the corporate gathering of the saints, O Lord, that this might be uh, a rallying point, O Lord, for your saints and your soldiers that we could come here and rest but for a moment before we enter in again to the battle at B. Lord, let us hear your word with clarity of thought. Guide our hearts and our minds this morning, O God, that we would read your word and that it would sink deeply, O Lord, that we would see its truths and apply them to our lives, that we would take these truths, O God, and that we would preach them to ourselves daily. Lord, help us and give us strength to evermore fight the good fight of faith that we might enter your rest together. Be with us now, O Lord. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to know your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord from Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, 
pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions. For within three days, you are to pass over this Jordan and go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you. And they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan towards the sunrise. And they answered Joshua, All that you have commanded us to do, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. That is the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God. May he add his blessing to it. So where we come again, we we are here at the beginning of the book of Joshua in the first chapter, and previously we've just seen Moses has died, but God has raised up another. He's raised up Joshua to be this new Moses, to be the new leader of the people who will deliver them. He will send them and have them cross over the Jordan and enter into this promised land. And and so we see that he's given these orders directly from Yahweh, the Lord, and and now he is commanded to go uh, through the officers, the leaders, if you will, of the people to go into the camps and tell them, get ready, we're fixing to go. And, And that's exactly what we see, verses 10 and 11, we see the preparation to enter. And so we have this this very interesting, very unique uh, string or or string of uh, uh, of events. We have the Lord speaking to Joshua, Joshua speaking to the leaders, and the leaders to the people. And and so we we have here a direct uh, uh, speaking of the living God to the people through these leaders uh, over the people. And what do they say? Prepare, establish, make ready. Uh, uh, Verse 11, Uh, get ready. You're about to cross over in three days this Jordan, and you will enter in to the land that the Lord your God has uh, had you to possess, is giving you to possess as your possession. And that's a, that's a word that we see over and over and over again. So bear that in mind as we go through this text. Possession, possession, possession. God is saying, listen, this land, I know it, it, it looks uh, like the odds are stacked against you, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But you will possess this land. I'm giving it to you as your possession. It's yours. Take it. Go. And that's exactly what they do. They're, they're going in. But the, the most important thing is that they're entering together. He doesn't say to uh, the Benjaminites, um, get ready, you're going to go over first. Or, or, or he doesn't say uh, uh, to, to the Judahites, hey, get ready, you're going to go first. You're going to go by yourselves. No, they, they go to the leaders, the officers, to go to their specific tribes and tell every single one of the people, we're going together. We are one family. We are from uh, uh, Abraham, the children of Israel, and we're doing this together. The Lord is our God, and we enter this land that he is giving us, and we're doing it together. And that's what we see. But then we, uh, it transitions in verse 12, and, and we, we see something. So we have to put on... Uh, our, our, uh, um, our Old Testament hats and, and bring out some, some uh, historical things from the Old Testament, verses 12 through 15, remembering your vows. Joshua says uh, in verse 12, um, to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, he goes to these three tribes in particular, two and a half, uh, actually. And so he goes to them, and he, and he says to them, get ready, you're coming over too. Now, if you haven't read through your Bible lately, 
and I know a lot of us perhaps haven't. We should, mind you. <laughs> um, you read, read through your Bible, especially these parts in Genesis that don't always make sense. Um, but uh, he, he's speaking to them. Now, why is he speaking to them? We have to jump back into Numbers 32 and Deuteronomy 32 to understand why. These two and a half tribes, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, were um, uh, uh, different tribes who had a massive amount of livestock. And so while they're going through the, the wilderness wanderings, they're in the, the uh, desert of Sinai, they're there and, and they come to the edge or the border there uh, just outside of the land of Cana, on the other side of the Jordan River. And so they come to Moses and they say, we want this section. I know we're supposed to cross over the Jordan and go into the land of Canaan, but we like this stuff here. This land is good land. We want this. And Moses freaks out. Mo- Moses is, is freaking out because it looks like we're, we're having a repeat of what happened uh, just previously whenever the spies go into the land. you remember? Uh, the spies go into the land to map out the land of Canaan, and they come back, and what do they say? One, their, their cities are fortified. You can't get in them. There's no way. We can't break down these walls. You can't climb over them. You can't go under them. You can't go through them. They're impenetrable. Forget about it. Moreover, they have giants. They have giants. They're not just big dudes. They're giants, right? These are, these are uh, almost sort of legendary, uh, what Scripture calls the, the Anakim and the Nephilim. Uh, the, these are legendary, mighty men, giants, uh, their strength cannot be surpassed. There's no way we can beat these folks. They have huge walls and they have huge dudes uh, with rocking beards. There's no way we can beat these guys. Forget about it. And so these spies, they come back and they tell the Israelites, yeah, yeah pff, we're outmanned, we're outgunned. These guys are giants. Forget it. Forget it. Let's just, let's just keep being nomadic and stuff. And so what does Scripture say? That these spies, these, these, um, the, the ones who have gone in and seen this, they say these things to the people of Israel. Israel, and the scripture says their hearts melted. They were, I mean, it's just like a deflated balloon. They were ready. We're about to cross over the Jordan. They get this report, and they say, oh, okay, fine. All right. Well, we've just spent uh, a while crossing this desert, and now we're not even going to get to go in um, because there's no way we can win. And what does the Lord do then? The Lord looks at them and says, you unfaithful people, do you not know who the creator of the world is? Do you not know that I am your God and I go before you? You unfaithful generation, none of you will see the promised land except for the two faithful spies, Joshua and uh, the Canaanite. And, and so they, they um, the from that point on, they, they wander 40 years in the desert because of their unfaithfulness, because of their unwillingness to go into the land. And now, uh, right back on the border, after this 40 years, this generation has died off, they're about to go in again, and the, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh come to, the Lord, or, uh, come to Moses and say, you know, we kind of like it right here. I think we're just going to stay. And Moses is thinking, not again. Not again. We've just made it through 40 years. Everyone has died. I'm really old. We're going to have another rebellion. It's going to be another 40 years, and I'm I'm kind of sick of it. Moses has had a rough time, right? It's not just a rough case of the Mondays. It's a rough case for the past four decades. Um, And and so that's what's happening here. And so Moses says, listen, forget about it. And they uh, they, they say, listen, we, we understand what this looks like, but bear with us. This is good land. Uh, and it gives y'all more room uh, there across the Jordan for the inheritance. You all get more. We all get more. We're still one people. We'll still go with you. It'll be fine. And so Moses says, okay, fine. Okay, fine. You can have this land, but when the time comes, when we are ready to cross over, you're coming to fight too. And they say, absolutely. We're more than ready to fight. Bring it on. And so that's exactly what happens. That's what Joshua is talking about here, referring back to this command from Moses, from the Lord, that they enter together to fight, even though they have had their place of rest. And and I want to really focus on that. They're not just inheriting, notice, ground, dirt, a plot of land, geography, some trees and bushes over here. Scripture doesn't say that. 
It says they're inheriting, literally, a place of rest. A place of rest. It's not about the grass. It's not about the trees. It's not about the dirt. It's not about the soil. It's the place of rest. It's the true and better promised land. It's this place where God is in covenant with his people and they can live with him and worship him rightly. That's the rest. And what I, I, I'll just go ahead and give you a spoiler. Where we're heading with this is the fact that we find this rest as well. It's only in Jesus Christ where this rest is found. The true rest. This place of rest. All you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. That's what they're looking for. And what better rest is there? So it, it's not just that they're fighting uh, uh, to, to uh, further expand their kingdom and further expand their grazing lands. No, they're fighting for rest. They're fighting to have a place where they are delivered from their enemies, where they are in right covenant with the Lord their God. This is something far greater than just a plot of land. They're fighting for what we all long for most, rest. And then we see the response, verse 16 through 18. Now, we kind of have a a hopping back and forth, verses 10. He's speaking to all the officers uh, of uh, the the, uh, Israelites. Then he switches and goes to the the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And now back in uh, verse 16, He's speaking again, or, or the, uh, the one speaking to Joshua is the entirety. The, all of the officers are, are again speaking to him. And what do they say? They say, uh, all you command of us, we will do. Everywhere you send us, we will go. And everything you tell us to do, we will obey. As for you, uh, only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. That is, that uh, the Lord your God. We hope that he's totally with you like he was with Moses. We're we're really banking on that. And to any who do not obey you, what what the Lord is commanding you to do, any who do not obey, they shall die. And then they give the war cry, only be strong and courageous. And so they're hearing this uh, command from Joshua, and they're not thinking that this is just some guy talking. This is a man who has received command from the Lord. They're saying and believing wholeheartedly that the Lord their God is with them, and they have a right leader, one who will lead them in righteousness and lead them into this inheritance, lead them into this place where they find rest. Now then, we, we, uh, we come to, to sections like this again in, in Scripture, and, and we can be perplexed, of course. Uh, we we sometimes read it and we just think it's the ground. But, but look at what uh, the, the author of Hebrews says. Taking from this uh, very section, this very concept of entering into this place of rest. And hear what he says in Hebrews 4. And pardon the, the lengthy quotation, but it's uh, vital. Hebrews 4, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of enter, entering his rest still stands... Let us fear, lest any should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, from Psalm 95, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, we, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news fell to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day. Today saying through David so long afterwards in the word already quoted, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. Again, Psalm 95. 
For if Joshua had given them rest, listen to this, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive, work, pursue after to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Do you get what he's saying here? Do you understand? He, he's, the, the, the preacher here is not just saying, uh, do good things and hope you make it. He's saying, no, you do all you can. You preach as long as you can, as long as there's breath in your lungs that you and everyone you know enters the rest. This rest, this true and better Sabbath, this real rest through obedience to God. Make sure, make sure that you enter his rest. Preach. Don't let other people be led astray. Sometimes that means hurting people's feelings. The truth hurts, but it's the truth that sets you free. So I, I want to go through uh, th this passage and look at it under three headings. We enter rest together. We enter rest together in through three ways, straight from the text. We enter his rest by doing, we enter his rest by going, and we enter his rest by obeying. Uh, first, we enter his rest by doing. So uh, th these all three come from the response that we see in verses 16 through 18. Um, and, and so uh, verse 16, and they answered Joshua, saying, all what you have commanded of us, we will do. We will do. When we breeze through the scriptures, we sometimes miss key things like this. All you have commanded of us, we will do. And, and so th this isn't just um, sort, sort of the, the, you tell somebody to do something and they're just like, got it. The, this doing, this concept of, of going, it, it's filling it. It's fulfilling this promise. It, it, it's the act of going and accomplishing what has been commanded of you. And, and so we, we see entering the rest and looking, uh, reading particularly this portion of Joshua 1 in, in, in uh, light of Hebrews 4, we, we interpret scripture with scripture, uh, what this looks like is keeping the commands of God even when it hurts, right? Look at uh, just certain things from, from John, okay? First John 5, 2. But this we know, that we love the children of God. When we love God, and uh, the, the ESV translates it obey, but it's actually, uh, can, can also be translated do, his commandments. When we fulfill his commandments, the people of the world will see us We'll, we'll see that we are the children of God when we do what? When we love one another. And this is the refrain that we see throughout Scripture time and time again. Uh, um, it, it begins in Leviticus 19, uh, 18, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus repeats this in Matthew 22. What do, the, what, what do we do? How do we enter God's rest? We enter by doing what God has commanded us to do. And it seems very simple, and in fact it is, but it's difficult. It's difficult. I, I've heard a few times uh, and, and have been one to, uh, to, to think the same thing sometimes. You know, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, but there are some that, who I might see in heaven and in the, the new heavens and in the new earth where, you know, when we're passing by and I might just spot something over here so I don't have to talk to them, you know what I mean? I love them as a brother or sister in Christ, but I don't much care for them. I love them, I just don't necessarily like them. In the James chapter 2, it picks up the same sort of idea, and uh, as James can only do, pushes on a nice bruise. And says, don't, don't pick favorites. 
What you're doing right there, don't do that. You, you, you see uh, a nice person who is clothed with the finest of clothes come walking in, and you say, come, sit next to me. And then you see somebody walk in with rags that might smell a little bit funny, hasn't shaved in forever, is probably homeless, and you say, you should sit at the back. You see what's wrong with that? You're not doing what God commanded you. You're not striving and hoping that all of God's children will enter his rest. We're very quick to want to go uh, do missions in places that are very nice, don't we? We're, we're eager to go uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, door-to-door evangelism, if, uh, if, if you've ever done that sort of thing, to the rich neighborhoods. Because what are they going to do? They'll, oh, yes, that's good. Here's 10 bucks. Go on your way. Yes, I'll take the, the little gospel track you have. But the homeless people, we don't go to them, do we? To the places that are dangerous, we don't go there. We like to go uh, maybe do uh, uh, sidewalk preaching at Disneyland so we can get in a side roller coaster and everything. But when somebody steps up and says, I want to go to Iran and I want to preach the gospel there, and it'll probably cost me my life. We say, you're crazy. Why would you ever do that? But is that not what we're commanded to do? To go to all, to preach, to show God's love to the world, first by loving God, but then by loving each other. Church, I hate to say it, but we do a terrible job at that sometimes, don't we? We say this group and that group, this group is different than we are. Is it a gospel issue? Not at all. They like different carpet than we do. Heretics. You see the meaninglessness of this? They worship just a little bit differently than we do. They're wrong. Let's not have fellowship with them. No. The command is that we enter God's rest arm in arm with all. We preach even when it hurts. The world sometimes will hate us. You you never read too many places in Scripture of, of a brother or sister going and telling another brother and sister, turn from your ways and somebody's not offended. That's, that's just a humanly thing. That's not a new development. And yet, what are we commanded to do? We're commanded to enter his rest together by keeping his commandments. The world will know us by our love for God and by our love for each other. We enter his rest by doing. Secondly, uh, we enter his rest by going. We enter his rest by going. We, we see this again in uh, verse 16. Anywhere you send us, everywhere you send us, we will go. So, so we, we, we see that, and sometimes we have a hard time conceptualizing uh, uh, the fact that um, what they're doing is going into a very dangerous place. We, we read through uh, the stories, and especially if, you, if you're fluent in Christianese, like many of us are, or, or you're very familiar with uh, the story, at least right here, with Rahab and Jericho, and they march around the city, and the walls fall down, and they go right in, and it's all yippity-dee, and they win. Woohoo! But what you don't understand is their enemies are formidable force, uh, forces. I, I mean, the, the, you, the spies who went in and saw the land and saw the people, they were uh, halfway right of saying, this army is crazy huge. They're, they're not just big in number. They're not just big in size, but they are powerful. They have advanced technology. Their weapons are superior. I, I mean, some of their swords weigh more than we do. Of course we're scared to go against this enemy. 
They, they had good right to, to look at that and think, well, this should be a challenge. And, and sometimes we gloss right over that. And yet they say here, you're telling us to go against uh, armies that are almost legendary, are mythical in size. But we'll go. We will go freely. We will do it without hesitation. The same is true for the church. Of course, the uh, never overly cited Matthew 28, 18, 20 through 20. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded them to do. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. It's the same promise. It's the same promise. Now, Matthew's whole point, and I would love to study through Matthew uh, with you all someday, to see that Matthew's whole premise in writing is that Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh from the Old Testament. The, the command that the Lord is giving Joshua here, Jesus is commanding the disciples in Matthew 28. He's saying, I am the Lord. I'm going with you always. I'm sending you everywhere. Go. But what do we do? Like, we're not even just worried about going to Somalia, which we should go. We're worried about telling cousin Eddie at the family reunion that his life is not consistent with the Bible. His life shows no fruit. We're scared to go to work and say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let me show you. Let me just show you this truth, this gospel truth, this truth that has transformed my life. Let me uh, share with you what I've read this morning that's utterly changed my day. The fact that Jesus died, uh, was buried and raised from the dead. He died for my sins. We're scared to tell people that. And that's not, that's not even going anywhere far or exotic or dangerous. That's sitting at a table with our neighbors. And yet we're commanded to go across the street and around the world. That is what the Christian life looks like. Going and gathering the lost. You, you, you would see something like this, honestly. When, when you see a soldier, right, in, in the military, uh, a, a commanding officer goes to them and says, listen, you're going to go into this area. It's going to be very dangerous. There's a chance that you might not make it. And they say, forget about it. I'm not going. That's what we call insubordination. That'll get you in some trouble. But what do Christians do? We commit some of the worst insubordination in the world that the world has ever seen. Go, make disciples. Just tell somebody about Jesus. I'm scared. I don't want to. Sometimes I think we've found our rest in the wrong things, and that's why. We don't understand the rest that we're preparing to enter and that have entered already. We don't understand the rest that awaits us and all believers where we would preach, where we would go. We enter his rest together by preaching to lost souls by preaching the gospel. That's how we enter together. We enter God's rest by going. Thirdly, we enter God's rest by obeying. By obeying. We see that in verse 17. All which we obeyed from Moses, thus we will obey you. Now, in uh, the Hebrew mind, uh, we, we kind of have to understand the difference. We, we think of doing and obeying as the same thing, but there's clearly from this passage here, there's a distinction. 
that Joshua was trying to draw out. The just doing and obeying are sort of two different things. Two different things. All you tell us to do, we will do. All you command of us, we will do it. All that you uh, and Moses have uh, commanded us to obey, we will obey in the same way that we obeyed Moses. But there's a distinct difference here, uh, especially in Hebrew thought. And so we, we see particularly uh, in the Old Testament, um, the Hebrew word Shema for all my uh, Hebrew nerds out there, and a kuo for all my Greek nerds out there. Uh, it's the same um, concept. It's not just to obey, but it literally means to hear. Right, and so the, the daily prayer of the, the Jews is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, now this isn't just a matter uh, uh, of just do it, obey. Uh, you, you know, somebody tells you to do something, you go and you do it. No, it's, it's hearing it, right? And, and so uh, yeah, when, I, when I was going through trying to illustrate this, you know, it, the only thing, and sorry dads, I know it's your day, but we hate on you anyway, Right? For Mother's Day, we go all out. We buy her some sort of Sephora thing. I don't know, Pandora necklace that cost all the money that we had to spare. And then for Dad, maybe a nice T-shirt. I found this coffee mug with a cartoon on it. I thought you might like it. But Dads, don't worry. We're, we're going to hate on you some more. So here we go. Um, we all have had those moments. Uh, I, I think men, men are equipped with a, a special gift to where we can hear, but we don't hear. You all know what I'm talking about, right? You all know what I'm talking about. Just be honest, okay? This is a place of repentance, okay? Confession and repentance, that's biblical. You hear, but you don't hear, right? And so, and so she's telling you, you know, all the things about her day, and you, you've already been filled up with words from work, right? You've been, you've been told so many things during the day that your word count has reached the max, but your wife has, has X amount of things that she must say or the day is not complete. And so you, you fall into the uh-huh mode. You all know what I'm talking about, okay? This, that, and another, and today we did this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah. That sounds rough. What did she just say? Uh, something about some guy at the grocery store. No, it was about the kids. You've already messed up. Your day is over. <laughs> Go buy chocolate quick. You're in trouble, okay? Get ready to sleep on the couch. It's coming. You hear, but you don't hear. The hearing that we see here, the obeying, the Shema that we hear, here is hearing. They have been commanded to do something. Now take it to heart. Don't just hear it, hear it. That's how this is going. And so they, they've been given this law from the Lord. They, they've seen an entire generation of rebellious people going astray, who did not listen, who did not hear the word of God, and they are saying, we're different. We've seen what keeping covenant fidelity, what keeping uh, being faithful to the Lord, not being idolaters, not going astray, not... Uh, looking at this formidable force, this huge army before us and, and shaking in our boots, but trusting the Lord daily. And everything that God has commanded of us through Moses and through you, we will obey. We will hear. We will take it to heart. And, and so it, it, we, we see this in particular. But what are we to do? What is the Christian to do? We uh, so often are, are caught up uh, specifically in getting through stuff, right? Especially us in, in the Western world. We, have, we like lists where we can check stuff off and we feel accomplished, right? So I have my daily list of things I must do. And as I go through, I check it off, I check it off, I check it off, I check it off. So sometimes we come to Scripture and we do the same thing, don't we? We come here, I have my nice little 
daily devotion where I read half a verse and I feel full and accomplished and I can check it off my list, go out the door, and it's all good. But that's not hearing. What we are to do, the command that we see, again, pointing back uh, to, to the first part of chapter 1, what are they to do? What is Joshua commanded by the Lord to do? To take the law, the instruction, the Torah, and to uh, meditate on it, to literally murmur it to himself. That's what obeying, that's what hearing looks like. All that the Lord commands us to do, we obey. We speak to ourselves. We meditate on it daily. Let it sink deeply. Let it, let it change us. Let us go to places like James and read that and not think of other people, but think, he's talking to me. To go to the places in Scripture and see uh, the unfaithful ones and think, that's me. Then go to the places where we see the gloriousness of Christ and think, how great a Savior. How great a sacrifice. That the Lord would see fit to take Christ's righteousness and while looking at one who has gone astray, see Christ's righteousness bestowed to me. How great a God. That's what hearing looks like. Keeping in mind Hebrews, he's telling us the same thing, Hebrews 4. We enter God's rest by hearing God's word, by keeping and obeying. We enter his rest and we do it together. Church, we have, we have entered God's rest. Those who are believers, we have entered into the most glorious rest we could ever hope for. We stand before a holy, righteous God, clean, not by our own doing, but by that of Christ, the Son of God. No more does he see our iniquity. We are counted righteous and blameless. You can sleep at night for all eternity. God sees you with Christ's purity. And yet we wait for an eternal rest with our Savior. This rest we enter together. O oh, church, stand and fight the good fight of faith together. Run the race together. And in doing so, we enter God's rest together. Let us pray. O oh, great God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, that it is clear that we can see what it is we are to do, O oh Lord, that we can see where it is we are to go, and we can see and know what it is to obey your word. Lord, I pray that you be with this group of believers, O oh God, and believers all across this world that they would see this day, Lord, and cherish it. That we could do what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, we would not forsake the assembly of the saints of God, but that we would, we would uh, count our week and base it on this one day, this one privileged day, O oh Lord, where we can come together and worship you, where we can rest and taste, but a mere taste of the glorious eternity that awaits us, O oh God. That we can read your word and see this rest that we have already entered and the rest that is to come. Lord, I ask that you would have us all be strong and courageous. That we would have the strength and the courage to do all you have commanded of us, O oh God. That we would have the strength and the courage to go wherever it is you send us that we would have the strength and the courage to obey your word, even when it means us changing who we are. Guide us now, O Lord. Send us into the world. Give us a burden for the lost, O God, that we would preach your gospel 
and that all of your children would ensure your arrest together. Be with us now, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's respond with this simple song and worship uh, one final time as we come to a close. I love you, Lord, and Hey.